Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Good to see you this morning. We are in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 to 19. It's a part of our series of messages entitled Strategic Living in a Strange Land. As we are in a strange land, as believers, we're passing through this world. Amen. And uh, today's message is entitled Our Faithful Creator. Within our text, once again, Peter addresses the topic of suffering. He's been talking about it quite a bit here in the book of First Peter. And you may ask why. Well, it's because the churches that he mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, were being severely persecuted. Uh, the churches that were dispersed throughout Pontus, that is Asia Minor, or today, modern-day Turkey. And uh, they were going through tremendous persecution. They were suffering for the sake of Christ. To many of us who live in the West today, it's hard to kind of relate to extreme suffering. We've been persecuted for the Lord. People don't like us because we read our Bible or we go to church and we love the Lord. But we haven't experienced severe persecution. And Peter exhorts, Exhortation here, I think, for many of us in the West, it can start to sound like the flight attendant's instructions uh, while you're sitting in the exit row. You know, when you're sitting in the exit row, they come and they give you these instructions and they want your full attention and all. In the emergency row, the exit row, that you, you're supposed to give a verbal yes, indicating you have heard the instructions and you agree to assist in case of an emergency. Uh, we may give a verbal amen to what Peter exhorts us uh, with here today in our text, but are we really listening to the instructions? It's important for us to listen to these instructions. We may not need them now, but we may need them later. Amen. The instructions found here uh, should be taken seriously. Why? Because really persecution and uh, among believers, or in suffering, I should say, of Christians around the world today is not on the decline, but it's on the rise. According to the, an article uh, published by CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, uh, the One Doors International Ministry, Open Doors, I should say, Open Doors International Ministry, uh, it's an outreach to the persecuted church around the world. They said this, and I quote, that worldwide, Christians are now facing more persecution or discrimination than ever. One in seven Christians worldwide now experience high levels of persecution and discrimination, close quote. High levels. Not just somebody doesn't like me because I go to church or I say I'm a Christian, but these, these are believers, one out of seven, who are, who are experiencing extreme persecution today, and the number of those Christians is on the rise. So understanding the spirit that, the, this fact that the spirit of Antichrist is, is really uh, abounding around the world, the spirit of Antichrist, let us, if you will, metaphorically take out those earbuds <laughs> and take off the headsets, you know, listen to our tunes, all the distractions, just like the flight attendant will tell you to do in the emergency exit road. They always will tell you, take out your earbuds, take off the headset, because what I have to share with you is very important. And I think metaphorically speaking, we need to take away any distractions this morning, thoughts going through our mind or whatever, to listen carefully, fully, to give our full attention to the instructions of the Apostle Peter, because one day we may soon need them. Amen. In verse 12, if you read along with me, Peter begins here and he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Strange things happen to other people, but not to me. Aren't we shocked when it happens to us? Do not be alarmed at these Trials, fiery, he didn't call them trials, but these are fiery trials, are coming your way as if something strange is happening to you. As followers of Christ, it is not a strange thing when we find ourselves 
under attack. What soldier signs up for the infantry frontline duty and is shocked when the enemy starts shooting back? That's a naive soldier. Amen. Uh, if you're firing at him, he's going to fire back at you. And the Bible says we are soldiers of Christ. Did you know that you are a soldier of Jesus? And uh, it tells us in 2 Timothy, Paul says to young Timothy that you, therefore, must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Hardships are natural for a soldier on the front line. And just as hardships are natural for the soldiers, so is fiery trials natural for those who are disciples of Christ because we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, chapter, verse 29, rather, chapter 1, verse 29 says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's a, that sounds weird to really our flesh when we think about it, because if you know, come to Christ, believe in him. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but it's been granted you, you <laughs> as a privilege to you to also suffer for Jesus' sake. Whoa, wait a minute. Hang on. I signed up for the believe part, but not the suffering part. But if you signed up for the believe part, you also have to sign up for the suffering part. Amen. He said, you can't be my disciple unless you're willing to pick up your cross daily and what? Follow me. It's granted as a privilege. We have the privilege. Here's the privilege. We have the privilege of being fashioned into the likeness of Jesus Christ through fiery trials. Privilege. I mean, you know, that's not a privilege. Granted. Or oh, privilege to me is tickets on the 50-yard line at an NFL game. I said Saturday night, I said, tickets for me is, a, is, is like getting, you know, tickets on the 50-yard line at a Bronco game. Then I thought, no, that may not be a privilege. Amen. <laughs> at least not this year. Amen. <laughs> but when I think of privilege or granted, oh, privilege, oh, front row, you know, access or whatever. But the privilege here is to be conforming into the likeness of Jesus. Fiery trials, the Greek word for that phrase is porosis, is the way it's pronounced in Greek, that word, and it means refiner's fire, the burning by which metals are heated and reduced, melted down. In other words, God takes the fiery trials that the devil means for evil, and he takes the same flame and uses it for our good. The same fiery trial, because the thing coming against you a lot of times, that fiery trial, you know, persecution is not from God, it's from the devil. But that same flame, God would take that same flame and use it for our good. And how does he use it for our good? He uses the flame like a refiner's fire to burn away the dross, that what is dross, that which is worthless, that we might know true spiritual wealth in becoming more like Jesus. The old sermon illustration of the, the, the goldsmith and melting down the gold and the impurities would rise to the top, and, which is called the dross, and he would shave off the impurities and do that several times. And the goldsmith knew the gold was pure when he could see his reflection in it. And God knows that our heart is right when he can see his reflection in it, and he will send fiery trials that the dross of your life may raise to the, rise to the surface, not that you might be condemned, but that he might skim it off, skim it off, skim it off until we reflect the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Proverbs 17, 3 says that the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Satan seeks your hurt, God seeks your heart. The devil wants to destroy you, God wants to deliver you. Thus the Lord God promised all who have put their trust in him. We have a glorious promise against the flames that the devil may try to bring against us, the weapons he bring against us. In Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. God will condemn it. 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Isn't that a glorious promise? No flame that the enemy brings against me, no trial he might try to bring against me because of my love for God will prosper. This is what the Lord says. And every word of condemnation the enemy brings against us, God himself will condemn it. Therefore, Peter declared in verse 13 in 1 Peter chapter 4, but rejoice. Like, Whoa, now, Peter, you're really getting crazy here. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Wow. Rejoice that I partake in the sufferings of Christ. And think about the sufferings of Christ. He was rejected. He was rejected by his own. He went to his own, his own people. The Bible says his own did not receive him. They did not receive him. They rejected him. In fact, they crucified him. He was rejected. He was ostracized. He, you know, people didn't understand him. All these different things. These are the sufferings of Christ. These are the things that we go through many times with our own families and people we try to witness to. He tried to love people and people just hated him. Have you ever tried to love somebody? They hate you. You're trying to love them into the kingdom and they just continue to hate you. You're a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. Jesus came into a Christ-rejecting world, and yet he gave his life for us, that through faith in him we might have ever, everlasting forgiveness and everlasting life. That word partake in the uh, original Greek language of the New Testament is the word koinonia, koinonia is the word, but it, we also have koinonia, we get it from as well, and it means to come in communion or fellowship with. God is no more closer than when we are going through a time of suffering. He's no more closer. I mean, he's closer than, at that time than at any other time when we're going through times of suffering. Why? Because we are in communion with him. When we've been rejected for his namesake, when we've been persecuted and ostracized by people, the Lord is close to us because why? He understands what it means to be rejected. And he communes with us. We have communion with him. We have fellowship with him in the midst of that suffering. The sustaining hope that we have in, our, in times of suffering is found in Romans chapter 8 as well, verses 16 and 17. And the Bible says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, with your spirit, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And here's that great glorious hope, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together in Christ. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified as well. That's the glorious hope that one out of every seven Christians who are undergoing severe persecution as we sit here in relative comfort and safety this is the glorious hope they have that though they may suffer for him, they shall also be glorified with him. Amen. That's their sustaining hope for our dear brothers and sisters around the world. In this we greatly rejoice. Not only the reward, we know there are people, they pie in the sky by and by. Oh, you know, you're going to be glorified with the Lord. Yes, but. Even now, the suffering that we're going through is glorious because it's a benefit to those who are around us as well. And I highlight this by pointing out what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. He says, I now rejoice in my sufferings. I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Wow. In other words, he's saying suffering here is not just about me. When I'm going through a time of suffering, I don't know about you, but it's all about me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm suffering. But I fail to recognize many times that what God is doing is not just for me, but for those who are around me. And this is what Paul is talking about here. He says, I, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the affection or the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body. In other words, what I'm going through, the suffering I'm going through, what I'm experiencing, God is, is doing a work in me so that he might fill up that which is lacking within the church. Are you with me? Oh, let's read on. Amen. 
He says, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. What's the end game of me going through my suffering is to fulfill the will of God, the word of God. That's what it is. What does God's word say? God's word is, you know, it speaks about edifying the entire body of Christ, not just edifying myself. The things that I have suffered as a pastor, and I don't stand here and tell you about all my suffering and all that, but pastors have sufferings too. (laughs) They go through times of suffering. They have rebellious children. They have financial needs. All these different things that I've gone through. I'm talking about years of God preparing me to be the pastor of this church. I think about it, you know, uh, when God called me to pastoral ministry, I was ordained first time in 1981. And all those years, I still didn't, couldn't figure out what God wanted me to do. But all those years, you know, well over 40 years, he's been sending me through experiences and all so that now I can stand before you and help to fill up that which may be lacking in you. How? With the word of God, according to the will of God. Amen. And so God is doing that in your life as well. The sufferings you're going through is not about you. Oh, I'm suffering. It's for your wife. It's for your husband. It's for your children who will come after you, who need a a legacy, an inheritance of faith in Christ. The suffering you're going through is to to fill up something within somebody else, to be a blessing to someone else. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that this comfort that you have received, that same comfort, go out and comfort others. The comfort we receive from the Lord, comfort others with that same comfort. The Holy Spirit sends us through things, and he comes and he comforts us, and he brings us through. That's so that he can just bring us through so that we can be a blessing to other people around us. Amen? Oh, give God praise and glory for that. So Paul here is, is saying, and basically that's why he rejoices, because he knows what I'm going through is going to be a blessing for you. Wow. It's more than just about me and my personal comfort and ease. But listen, we cannot fill up that which is lacking in other people until we're willing to submit to the refiner's fire. Until we're willing to submit to the refiner's fire that we might be fitted. Here's what God sends us through the fire, that you may be fitted for his divine purpose and will. God is fashioning. Are you going, fashioning you for his perfect divine purpose and will. Are you going through suffering right now? Are you watching online? You're going through suffering right now, a time of suffering. God is fashioning you that he may fit you in a a situation and will fit you within his purpose and will within the church to fill up that which may be lacking in someone else. You know how refreshing it is to walk away from someone that you've been in their presence and they've lifted you up and they blessed you and you walked away. Praise the Lord. They're filling something up within you, but they had to go through something to do that. They didn't just get that from a book. Amen. You got to walk through some things. Dear sister came up to me last service and she said, but Pastor, I've been downloaded the One Place app. I've been listening to your messages. I listen, going to work and coming home and all this. And it's been such a blessing. And I think, praise the Lord. It's just the word of God. It's not Pastor Al. It's the word of God. But God had to do something in me. The messages came through <laughs> the fire, amen? They came through a fiery trial. That's where they came from. Not something I read in a book. I don't just down, click and download. No, God had to download something in me, amen, by sending me through the fiery furnace, amen? God be praised, amen? Praise his holy name. And I thank God that he's made my life a blessing to other people, to other people that are cursed, but to most people, amen? But he's made my life a blessing, and he wants to do the same thing in your life. That's why Paul and Peter say here, rejoice. And we're going, these guys are crazy. But listen to the words of James. He's a sadomasochist also. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, you listen to his words, you go, what are you talking about? He's talking about kingdom of God. He's talking about kingdom of God. He's not talking about, you know, the latest therapy and wokeism or anything else. And what does James say? My brethren, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I mean, it says lacking nothing, knowing that my God, because I have Christ, I got everything I need. I'm not lacking anything. I don't have what I want, but I got more than I need. Amen. 
And the problem with a lot of Christians, and I'm throwing myself in that number two, is that sometimes God is, well, let patience have his perfect work. We jump off the operating table too soon. Amen. We wake up halfway through the operation. Oh, I'll do I'll finish the rest myself, Lord, and run out and hole in our stomach. Got a big incision in here. And God is operating. You know, he's a skillful surgeon. He cuts the hill, by the way. Amen. And, and while he's cutting, we jump up and, oh, well, I'll do it myself. Running around, you know, with your stomach open and everything, you know, spiritually speaking. Thinking we can finish the job. By Having begun in the spirit, will we now perfect ourselves according to the flesh? Paul says, we began in the spirit. Let the spirit have his perfect work within you that you may be complete, lacking nothing in Christ Jesus, but having everything that you need. When you're going through times of suffering, you got to stay on the table. Let patience have its perfect work. With confidence in the Lord, Peter reminds the church in verse 14 of 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. If you're reproached, that word reproached means undeserved reproach. That means undeserved, you're, you're being reviled, you know, for something you haven't done. You haven't deserved the reproach. People just don't like you because you love Jesus. He says, if you're being reproached for that reason, you know, then understand this, you're blessed. Blessed are you, what? The word blessed means happy. Happy are you, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You say, well, that's crazy. No, that's kingdom. Jesus said it as much in Luke chapter 6 when he said, blessed are you when men hate you. <laughs> when they exclude you, they don't invite you to the parties. You didn't get the invitation or the memo. And they revile you. They hate you. They speak evil of you. and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something, you know, you walk into a room and people are talking about you and all, you know, the gossip about you, and you just turn around and start jumping for joy. Woo-hoo! Yeah. <laughs> it's because I love Jesus. They're talking about me. It's all right. I'm going to go ahead and celebrate. Amen. Amen. For indeed, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner, Jesus said, their fathers did to the prophets. In other words, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets came and the ancestors of the Jews in Jesus' day, they killed the prophets. For what? For speaking the truth. For calling the people to repentance. They, They didn't want to hear that. So they would kill the stone, the prophets, they would kill the prophets. Just as people don't want to hear the truth today. This reproach, again, comes by way of guilt by association. If you're associated with Jesus, then men will hate you. They will hate you. Where's this hatred coming from? It's the same place that the, the hatred that we see demonstrated by Hamas for the Jewish people. It's same, coming from the same source. It's the devil. And why does the devil hate the Jews so much? Because God used the Jewish people to give birth to the Messiah to be the Savior of the world. Amen? And, and he, he, he's, the devil's never forgiven him for that. Never will. He hates the Jewish people. He destroyed the Jewish people because God used them for his, his glory. And so we see this hatred, but the same thing with Christians. The same way, reason the enemy hates Christians. The reason people will, the world will hate you. This reproach, it it comes by guilt by association because we're followers of Jesus Christ. Upon such individuals, Peter says, the glory, listen, for those who are hated, for the haters in the world that hate believers because of your association with Jesus Christ, Peter says, for those who are being hated, God's 
glory, spirit of glory and the spirit of God, that is the Holy Spirit, rest upon you. That word glory is from the uh, Greek word doxa. It means opinion or view, but it also means splendor, brightness, dignity, and magnificence. God's glory, his favor, his dignity, and magnificence rest on those who are hated for Christ's sake. And it's something, his, his glory, his spirit rests upon us. That word rest is, 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 is something that is, it speaks of what God does. It's not what we do. Uh, God places his rest upon us. It's from the Greek word anapao, and it means to cause to, or permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. It is quiet, calm, and patient expectation. My expectation is in what God is able to do, not what I can do for God. Rest, it rests upon me. That means it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with God. It's resting upon me because I am resting in what God is able to do, not what I'm able to do. I learned a long time ago, God is my PR manager, public relations manager. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to convince people I'm a bag of chips and all that. I don't have to be in charge of that. God is my PR manager. In fact, exaltation does not come from the north, south, east, or west. The Bible says it comes from the Lord. He raises us up. And if God is for you, can nobody be against you? Amen. You may go say, amen. Praise his holy name. You may go through a time of suffering and people may reject you and put you down, but it's all right because they can't keep down what God is lifting up. Amen? That's the glorious hope we have as believers. God is your PR manager. You don't go around trying to fix things, convince people that you're cool and, and you, you know, you're, you're down with them and all. None of that. You just love Jesus. Amen? Exaltation comes from the Lord. And notice the believer's recovery, that definition for rest, that, that you know, he, we cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect our strength. In order to, to recover and to have power and strength, it, it, we don't, we're not doing it. God just gives it to us. What's he give us? He gives us recovery. What is recovery? Reconciliation, restoration, better word. Restoration. And then he gives us his power, his strength. It rests upon us because we are, have chosen to rest in God. Do you follow that? God's power, when you're being rejected by the world, reproached by the world, hated by the world, his glory and his spirit will be resting on you. That's why we can read in the Fox's book of martyr, martyrs how the, the apostles were, were martyred beheaded, sawn in two, thrust through with the sword and all these horrible deaths that they faced. Not one time did they say, whoa, 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 whoa. We stole the body of Jesus. He's not raised from the dead. Not one time because they knew that he was alive and they could not deny the truth. And they went through all of that and they faced it boldly. Why? Because the power of God's glory and his spirit was resting on them. How are we going to get through the struggles of the future? Our personal sufferings and personal trials is with the glory the, uh, and the spirit of God resting on us. But it can't rest on you unless you're willing to rest in him. What does the Bible tell us? Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know. Stop trying to fix your husband. Stop trying to fix yourself. Let God's glory and spirit rest on him as you put your faith in what God is able to do rather than what you're able to do. Verses 15 and 16, Peter exhorts the church. He says, you know, if you're going to suffer, don't suffer for, being, for doing stupid stuff. And you won't find stupid stuff in your Bible. I've added that. But don't, do not suffer for behaving wrongfully. 
In verse 15, he says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a, uh uh-oh, busybody in other people's business. Other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Listen to this. But let him glorify God in this matter. That's the, let me kind of full disclosure. That's the last thing I'm thinking about when I'm suffering. But then I have to remind myself that's the first thing I should be thinking about. When I'm going through suffering, how can I glorify God in this matter? In Peter's day, the Jewish Sanhedrin, they were the religious council in Jerusalem. And I say Peter's day, this is after Jesus had ascended into heaven and the apostles were telling people about Jesus in Jerusalem. And uh, the religious council got together and brought the apostles before them, were threatening them. And they wanted to kill him, but a, a well-respected Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel convinced them that, you know, don't kill these guys because this, this movement's going gonna, gonna to phase out. There's another guy that said he was somebody great and his followers, they dispersed. They, it all fizzled out. This will fizzle out too. (laughs) I wonder what Gamaliel is saying today. (laughs) But he said, but he also said, but if this is of God, this move is of God, then we find ourselves fighting against God. But he convinced them that that they were just, you know, these apostles, their zeal will soon wear out and and they'll they'll go by the wayside, just like all these other so called messiahs. And uh, so they decided not to kill the apostles, they decided to beat them and to threaten them. And rather than be ashamed, we'll see here in Acts chapter 5, the apostles celebrated after they were being beaten. I don't know about you. You beat me. I'm going to be like, man, I, I, I wonder if one of the apostles, and probably none of them, obviously, but, you know, someone could have been thinking, man, if this is what it means to follow Jesus. I'm, I'm going to go back to my business or whatever. That I'm being beaten for sharing the gospel? I, th- I thought God was with me. I thought God was a God of prosperity, you know. <laughs> this doesn't feel like prosperity. But they had a kingdom mentality. And the glory and the spirit of God was resting on them. And here's what, his, this was their reaction. The Bible says, and they agreed with him, that is with Gamaliel, that they shouldn't kill them. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. We warned you guys. We beat you and we warned you. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Amen. And daily, they tell, don't you dare speak in the name of Jesus again. And daily, (laughs) in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Wow. Amen. You cannot do that without the Spirit of God being upon you. Without the glory of God being upon you, without resting in the Lord, his opinion, his magnificence rather than the world. In verse 14, the latter part, it says there that, of course, you know, on their part, that is the world. And I'm here in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. On their part, that is the world's part, Christ is blasphemed just like he is today. And on our part, that is the church, he is glorified. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The world doesn't, doesn't see it. People don't see it, no, and they can't see it until they're willing to have their eyes open to the Lord, until the Lord draws them to himself. They can't see it. I couldn't see it before I was uh, a Christian, and God opened my eyes through the teaching and preaching of the gospel. Although we might suffer shame for his name, he's like the apostles There is no shame in our game. Amen. Amen. Therefore, we can rejoice. For we have been saved from God's wrath through faith in Christ. Therefore, persecution and suffering for the believer, really, when you think about it, and this is uh, Peter's point, 
our, our suffering as a believer is this. It's an opportunity to glorify God in the matter. It's an opportunity to glorify God in the matter. How do we do that? Well, let me suggest seven ways that we can glorify God in the matter. Number one, walk by faith. Not by your flesh, not how you feel, but by faith. Number two, praise him in the midst of the suffering. You want to offend your flesh? Begin to praise him. Are you suffering today? Begin to praise him. Just say, Lord, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. You are worthy. Begin to praise his holy name for who he is. And then the third thing you can do, you want to glorify God in the matter, in the midst of your suffering, what you're going through, obey his word. Obey his word. The prophet Samuel said to King Saul that it's better to obey than to sacrifice. To obey is better than to sacrifice. And then the fourth thing that we can do, if indeed we want to glorify God in the matter, in the midst of our suffering, is repay evil with good. Again, that fire, that fiery trial can come from, from demo, a demonic source, and we might want to retaliate or whatever, but repay evil with good. I'm talking about in your own personal life. Repay evil with good. The Bible says overcome evil with good, Romans 12, 21. You know that person at work who's treating you in an evil manner? Bake him a cake, take it into him, and then smash it in the face. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that. Cut off a little sliver, put in a little Tupperware thing, take it into work, say, hey, I thought you might want this for dessert, you know, today after lunch or whatever, you know. But repay that evil that he brought your way with good, and you will be an overcomer. The fifth way in which we can, you know, um, glorify God in the matter is behave honorably towards all. An honorable behavior towards all people. And then the sixth way that we can glorify God in the manner is generously forgive. As it's been measured to you, so it be measured back to you. As you measure, so it may be measured back to you. Jesus encourages us to forgive liberally. Forgive as we've been forgiven. Be a generous forgiver. And the seventh thing, the seventh, number seven, if you want to glorify God in the matter, give thanks. Give thanks. Have a thankful heart. Now, the Bible says give thanks in all things, not for all things. In what you're going through. Now, what, what do we do when we give God thanks? When we're thanking God, have a thankful heart. We're recognizing that, God, you are over whatever I'm under. You are sovereign and have authority over whatever I'm under. And you say, well, I don't know what to give God thanks for. You know, just start with the small stuff like toothpaste. <laughs> you know, like, like taking a shower, you know, and hopefully everybody showered here today. But... Uh, <laughs> But you thank God for the, the running water, for things like toilet paper, things, clothes. You, you look in your closet and go, I don't know what to wear. Listen, billions of people have nothing to wear. They don't have toothpaste. They don't have toilet paper. So I'm thanking God for I thank God that I wake up in the morning and I'm not wet because there's a roof over my head. He put clothes on my back. I can open the refrigerator and go, uh. There's stuff in there I shouldn't eat, but I eat anyway. I have a choice, you know. We're blessed. Give God thanks in all that. I know stuff is falling down around me. It's like everything's falling apart, but in Jesus Christ, when I give God thanks and everything, I'm recognizing that everything is not falling apart. It's falling right in place, that he is in control. Amen. We move on through our text in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18 says, now here, he, Peter gets a little deeper here. He says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18, now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, and we are saved, but by grace. Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Where will those appear who, have, who do not have their sins forgiven? They don't have a chance when they stand in the presence of an almighty and holy God. In verse 18, Peter is quoting here Proverbs chapter 11, verse 31. The time has come for judgment to begin the house of God. And he talks about judgment here. He's not talking about the 
Judgment in Revelation chapter 20. What's happened in Revelation chapter 20 is something called the great white throne judgment. After Jesus Christ comes to the earth, he reigns for a thousand years. The Lord is coming back. And he will reign on the earth for a thousand years. After a thousand years, there would be the great white throne judgment. And all the people who have died will, be, will stand before God. Now, believers will not be standing in that crowd. Why? Because our sins are forgiven. Our works will be judged before the Bema seat of Christ, the Bible says. But we will not be judged because there's no condemnation in Christ, because we're in Jesus. But those who rejected the Lord, those who have lived the evil life, those who have, who have snubbed the gospel and who have died without Jesus, left this world without Christ, they will stand before God. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, the books will be open. God's got everything in the books. And why does God open the books? Well, I didn't put the two together until I read uh, Psalm 51 where David says, so that, Lord, when you judge, no one will be able to refute you, your judgment. When you judge, you'll be righteous. In other words, he opens the books to prove his case and to justify his judgment to condemning people to an eternal hell. It will be justified by what's written in the books. Oh, you had this time. You were at Calvary Worship Center on this day. An invitation was given to come to Christ. You ignored it. In fact, you walked out laughing. In fact, you walked out. You were full of pride. You went back to your old ways. You, this person told you about Jesus. Oh, but you turned away. It, it will all be recorded. And so when God sentenced that person to hell, eternal hell, there will be no appeal because it's in the books. It's a horrific day. I pray none of you will be there. I pray before you leave this church today that if you do not know you're on your way to heaven, that you will give your life to Jesus Christ. If you're watching online, you don't know your way, know that you're on your way to heaven today. You can know today and that you would give your life to Christ as well. Amen. So when he talks about judgment here, what he's talking about, the judgment. A judgment here from the Greek word uh, krima, or krima, and it's spelled K-R-I-M-A, and it means really judgment, a severe trial which would determine character. It's time for judgment to come to the house of God to determine the true character of the people in the house of God. Biblical scholars believe that Peter was referring to some imminent social upheaval in Asia Minor that the believers were facing which would test their faith. One commentator writes, Peter is referring to calamities so extreme as to settle the question whether one is truly a follower of Christ or not. The present crisis that we see in the Middle East, the instability of this world, the financial instability of our nation, there may be an extreme trial coming our way that will really test your Christian resolve as whether or not you are a follower of Jesus or not. Extreme. And so he's warning them about an extreme trial that is coming. I think we're in that place today. That's why I believe this teaching is so relevant. And you, you should sit up, take the earbuds out, take the headphones off, listen to these exit row instructions. <laughs> And John talks about those that were with the believers who came to church and did all those things, but they were not other believers. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, he says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, that is that one man that will come on the scene, I believe is alive today, that will have rule over the world. He says, you've heard that Antichrist is coming. He says, even now, many Antichrists, little Antichrists, you know, have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out. They, who are they? Those who are coming to church, who are with us in our, in our communion feast and all these different things. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. And that time is coming where the true colors of people who say they're Christians, the true colors will really begin to show. Calamity has a way of spiritually pruning the Lord's vineyard. Remember COVID-19. It is a test of character. 
As the old saying goes, if you want to know what a person really believes, watch them under pressure. Judgment begins at the house of God. It doesn't begin at the White House. It begins at God's house. I don't care, you know, and I just, I don't know how much time I have. I got to move on. Okay. But it's just, we keep looking at the White House. No, it's God's house. And I'm just, I'm just upset about things. Other people get upset, but I realize, no, Lord, it begins with us. Judgment begins at the house of God. And why is that? Because the church can determine the course of a nation. The character of the church can determine the course of a nation. So I don't know about that. Well, that's what Jesus said. When did he say that? He said, you're the salt of the earth. He said, you're the light of the world. When the world's in darkness, we should shine so bright. They look at the church and go, oh, that's what brotherhood looks like. That's what love looks like. That's what mercy looks like. That's what forgiveness looks like. Amen? But we fail to do that. And yet we have this promise in the Old Testament given to, the, to Israel, but we can apply it to the church today where the Lord said, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. I think that's still applicable today, but I do know what is really applicable is that judgment begins with us. And if we're not loving each other, we're not being light, we're not being salt, how can we ever expect America to turn around or the world? In conclusion, verse 19 is our concluding point where uh, Peter First Peter chapter 4 says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their soul to him in doing good as to a faithful Savior. Just three points there that I find in verse 19 and a way that we can summarize strategic living even in times of suffering. Number one, suffer according to God's will. Psalm 143 verse 10 says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Amen, Lord. The second thing that we can do in getting through times of suffering, a summary of strategic living in times of suffering, the second thing is to commit, commit ourselves in Christ to do good. To do good. Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Not some, but to all. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. And then number three, Place your trust in our faithful creator. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Aren't you glad God's a faithful creator? He's faithful to us. Amen. In times of suffering, amen. Praise his holy name. Oh, he deserves more than that. Come on. Come on. At home, come on. Give him praise and glory. He's a faithful creator. Amen. When we have been faithless, He's remained faithful in my life. I don't know about you. Glory to God. Commit yourself to a faithful creator. It's good to know that we have a faithful creator, a faithful savior to sustain us in these troubled times. Don't fret. This message is not to cause you to worry, but to know that you can trust the faithful creator, even in times of suffering. And when you think about it, think about it this way, you know, I said that we're sitting in the exit row. The reality is that everybody's sitting in the exit row, saint or sinner. You know, whether you believe in Christ or not, you're sitting in the exit row. Why? Because you're going to exit this world at one point or another. At one time or another, you're going to leave this world. One out of one person dies. You're sitting in the exit row. Here's the real question. Are you ready to meet God? And if you're not ready to meet God, you 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 can be ready. Get ready today by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in him shall not perish. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through faith in him, in Jesus Christ. That's how you can know that when you exit in the exit role that you're ready to meet God.